Hello and welcome to the video. This is a quick introduction before I hand over to Ben at 3DXR. Now 3DXR up here in the northeast of England and they are an outfit that make very large UAV systems, fixed wing and multi-rotors, usually based around Pixhawk for professional and prosumer pilots. But they're also stockists of a lot of the stuff that I buy regularly. Things like Team Black Sheep, Brain FPV, FR Sky, Hollybro, batteries, chargers, props, and a lot of the other stuff as well. So I always end up buying something when I'm here. But as Ben is a little bit of an expert when it comes to Pixhawk, I've got him to sit down and explain a couple of things. This time it's about camera triggering and some tips and tricks for how he uses a camera with a mission and also some of the tips and tricks for how he creates missions so that they work great every time. So a big thank you to 3DXR for taking the time to do these videos. Make sure you check out the other videos in the Big Boys Toys playlist and I'll hand over to Ben in the office. So in this video, I'll show you how to trigger a camera using Pixhawk and how to test that it is all working. So what we have here is uh, the Pixhawk 2 flight controller. Um, I've done the initial sort of calibration um, to get it into a state where it's, it's happy to to arm and we've got a connection here I'm using uh, the main output 7 which is connected to my camera trigger so for this particular camera it's a Seagull MAP2 and it has what's called a Sony multi cable there's a couple of parameters to set when using a camera trigger they can be found in the initial setup optional hardware and get the mouse to work. Um, need to go lower down. Oh, camera gimbal. And on the bottom of this menu here, we have one for shutter. So servo seven that corresponds to main output seven. And for this particular camera trigger, we need to have a pushed value of seventeen hundred, and a neutral or not pushed value of fifteen hundred. Then the duration that that's held for. In this case, it's a second. So is those, it, that information in the manual when, when you get the piece, does that come along with it? Yeah, so you can find this information in the documentation for the Seagull trigger and also general camera triggering information on Arduino Pilot. Uh, there's other methods to trigger a camera. You can use relays and alternative uh, camera triggers wh whose settings will vary. If you wanted to put this into main output 8, you could change this here to servo 8. In order to test that it's actually triggering, first thing you do is once you have made those changes to the camera trigger, you need to reboot your Pixel, which we've already done. To test the camera trigger, you also need to have power to the rail for the Seagull Map 2. So in this case, we're using a 5 volt Beck which we've just connected up here on the bench. You also have to have the safety switch pressed. So we've already done it in this case. We have the solid red light, so the safety switch has been pressed. From the main screen, the flight data screen and mission planner, right click, trigger camera now. And as you can see, it actuated the shutter. Right click, trigger camera now. So now we know the camera trigger is working. If you wanted to operate the camera from a switch, so say on a multi-rotor, you might wish to be able to take pictures on command. You could map um, a toggle switch on, for example, your Tratus to pass through to main output seven in this case. When you're using cameras for mapping, the triggering command is produced in the roof planning and the automatic waypoints. So you need to have tested first that your camera trigger is working to ensure that it's triggering pictures during flight. There's a little indicator on these seagull ones. The red light pulses or fades in and out when it's in a happy state. So in this example here, we'll show you how um, for fixed wing use, a survey grid is drawn, which will automatically trigger the camera. In this case, this field here is going to be the area of interest. In order to automatically insert a grid, 
I need to first draw a polygon. I can do this in two ways, by right clicking, draw a polygon and start adding polygon points. Or there's a handy shortcut in the left hand side here, which I can click on and then it becomes a polygon tool. These red markers define the boundaries of the polygon. Now that I have this polygon, I can adjust it or add more points, or in this case fill it with an automatic waypoint. So in this case I've right clicked, brought the extra menu, navigated down to auto waypoint, and the option I'm going to use is survey grid. This automatically puts in um, a set of grid lines based on the parameters you choose. The first thing I'm going to do is tick advanced options. This gives more control of the camera configuration and grid options. I need to define which camera I'm using. The list has some common cameras where we've got a Sony A6000. We also have a 16mm lens. If the camera you're using is not listed, there's a couple of ways you can save its information. You can manually type in details about the image size and the sensor size, or if you have a sample photograph on your desktop, you can load a sample photo and that information will be pulled out of the EXIF data. There's a few parameters I need to define on here, such as the mapping height. In this case, we'll use 120 meters. The flying speed. This will give us a good estimation of how long the mission should take. Let's assume 16 meters a second. I'll ignore the add takeoff and landing points at this stage. I'm going to tick the box here that says footprints just to give an indication of where pictures are taken. On the grid options I can specify the amount of overlap required. In this case I'll set the front overlap to 65% and the side overlap to 65%. My normal mapping method would be to use a cross grid. This flies the mission north to south in this case and then repeats it at east to west. This allows you to reduce the amount of overlap. If you don't do a cross grid, you'll need to increase the front overlap and also the side overlap to ensure the mold can be made correctly. On the final menu here, the camera config. By default, the triggering method is set correctly to trigger the camera based on distance. Also, this second box here is to break startups, starts. What this does is it stops the camera from being triggered in a corner, which would result in pictures that aren't facing straight down. There's other trigger options such as time intervals, but for best results, use a distance trigger. Another option you can do, fixed wing mapping is to add overshoot and also a lead in. So for this example we set the overshoot to 100 meters and the lead in to 50. What happens here is the plane will fly past the polygon for another 100 meters before it makes its turn. It's not as easy for fixed wings to turn compared to full multi-rotor so you need to allow this extra space for it to complete its turn and line up so that the area of interest is mapped while the plane is flat. This example of a mission here, the plane would fly the grid lines and trigger the cameras at the correct distance intervals to give you the required overlap specified in the settings. Accept the mission. So that section just shows a grid, but uh, I'll just show you a full mission. <coughs> we can still record it. So my normal method for planning a complete mission for this particular field with a fixed wing. This will be our takeoff location. First we're going to add a command called takeoff. We're asked to specify an altitude. In this case I'll use 100 meters and also a takeoff pitch. We'll use a default of 15 degrees. 
The takeoff command doesn't have any coordinates and it doesn't have a direction. Takeoff will happen in a direction you're launching in and it will climb to the specified height at this pitch angle that was defined. So in this case, 100 meters at 15 degrees. If you don't enter any more waypoints, the plane would simply return to launch and circle above you. What we need to add next is just a normal waypoint and then we'll draw a polygon again. I've accidentally added an extra waypoint here. I'll simply just delete that one. I'll move over to the polygon tool. I'll draw around the field of interest. I'll right click, auto waypoint tool, survey grid. The parameters I used before are say, saved. So we have here the height, the camera's correct. I'm going to enter the speed that's correct for the fixed wing being used, and I'll simply accept. We need to now exit the polygon tool, because if I stop clicking, I'm just adding more points. I can hover over the polygon tool shortcut and right click. We've now removed the polygon and we're back to waypoint mode. So far in this mission, we have a takeoff and then a survey grid. Next, I'm going to program a feature which will allow the plane to land in the case of a return to launch activated by the tr transmitter, in case of transmitter signal lost or low battery. So we need to define a landing sequence and we also need to use a special marker called do land start. I've added an additional waypoint here, the last one, number 34. I'm going to scroll down to the bottom of the waypoint list. Here's waypoint 34. I'll click on it and I'll change it to do land start. Do land start is just a marker in this list. So that waypoint's disappeared. And what do land start does is to tell the autopilot in the event of a failure or a turn to launch to go to the next item on the list. What I'm going to do now is just draw a little landing circuit to bring the plane in to approximately where we took off from. So I'll add a waypoint here. So this will be the first point the plane goes to in the event of a return to launch. I'm going to bring it down our flying field to reduce the altitude. So by default, every waypoint I've clicked has been at 120 meters. I need to change the altitude in this list here. So navigating to the last waypoint, I'm going to change the 120 meters to 60. And then I'm going to do another waypoint in line with our field, which can also be at 60 meters. And now I'm going to position the aircraft to head back towards the flying field. This is going to be my second last waypoint before we land. So this one I'm going to set to 30 meters. The final waypoint, which is going to be roughly where our home point is, will be a land. I'm going to right click and land. It's very important to have the waypoint before land to be about 30 meters and to be at the correct angle. So the change in height between the last waypoint and ground should be at about a 10% slope. Let's check that out. So in this case, the slope is shown as higher. I'm going to move the waypoint further away from land. Now we're at about a 10% slope. To load this mission onto the drone, with the flight controller connected by either USB or over a telemetry radio, I can click right waypoints. So those waypoints have now been written to the pixel. If I want to check that it has worked, I can right click and delete this mission and then read the waypoints back. It prompts you to reset the home coordinates. I'll accept. So what we have here is all those waypoints have now been pulled back from the pixel so I know they're saved. There's a couple of little tricks you can do if you plan complex missions. I could save this current mission path to the desktop. Save waypoint file. This will allow you to save 
and share the waypoint file. Also, when drawing a polygon and planning a grid, there's options to save within the waypoint tool. So I'll just bring up the survey grid tool again. If you're doing a very complex, large mission, you may wish to change the flight angle. And you might not know the angle you want to fly at until you arrive on site and see which direction the wind's going. I personally fly crosswind when doing fixed wing mapping. This gives the best results. It maintains the speed consistent. It maintains the speed and gives overall better results. What I can do on this screen here is to save the actual shape of a polygon. So if I look here at the bottom right hand part of the screen, it says I can press Control S to save. This will allow me to save the screen we're looking at here. So I can quickly save out this file and change the angle of the grid based on the conditions on the ground. Then add to that the takeoff and landing positions. Thanks for watching the video and watching right to the very end. You can find me in all the usual places on social media. And if you like the video and like what I'm doing here, then hit the subscribe button and hit the bell notification icon too. If you really like what I'm doing, you can go the extra mile and become one of my Patreons for access to me directly for support and also giveaways and regular updates too. If you're looking for particular content, then check out the playlist. I organize all of my videos into playlists. So if you're looking for a particular topic, you can find everything here. If it's called Introduction To, it's designed to start very simply and build on that simple introduction to teach you all about it. If it's called For Beginners, then that is really aimed at people who are brand new to that part of the hobby. You can also search on YouTube for anything that you're interested in using the search function at the top. So iNav Painless 360 will find all of my videos and even the playlists around iNav. So thanks again for watching and happy flying.